So welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for attending the training today. Um, so any of the kind of questions and stuff, I'll, I'll take them at the end and I'll answer them to the best of my capacity. If not, I can forward them over to people who are a bit more kind of specialized, depending on what you ask. So we'll just start by going over some of the kind of housekeeping and good practice rules. So I'm aiming for the training to be about 45 minutes long. It may be a bit longer because like Laura mentioned, it's the first time this has ever been kind of delivered online. Um, we'll split into five different sections just so it's a bit more kind of uh, easy to kind of ingest. Um, keep, keep yourself on mute throughout the training just to kind of stop any disturbances. Um, keep in mind we do cover some sensitive content and there will be some videos of kind of uh, real life um, issues caused by some substances. Again, if you if you do want to have a chat at the end of the, the session, please feel free to email me or we can we can have a chat face to face. Um, respect for the others within the kind of training, the data protection and any confidentiality shared. And like I said, feel free uh, feel free to email me at the end um, and then we can kind of address any of the issues you may have. OK, so we're going to break up into five sections. So we're going to start with what Change, Grow, Live is. Um, Non-opiate awareness, opiate, alcohol, and then at the end, brief interventions, harm reductions, and kind of conversational support with um, potentially any any people you may manage or oversee in a HR capacity, and how you can support conversations. So we'll start with who we are. So we are the largest provider for drugs and alcohol treatment in the UK. We are a free voluntary service. Uh, we support all levels of dependency, so someone who may begin to realise that they may have an addiction to a substance or somebody is heavily dependent on the substance, so for example a heroin user, um, and we will attempt to help anyone who engages with us, so anyone looking for our support, we will give 100% back, um, but people who are taking substances need to be essentially open to making that change. Um, so like I mentioned before, we're free, we're confidential and we are voluntary service. Uh, we overseen by Coventry City Council and their commissioners um, and we support with all substances. So not just heroin and alcohol, we support with with cocaine or cannabis or any kind of uh, substances that are out there. So we're split into uh, teams within the within the company itself. So there's a, a variety of different things that this may not mean too much to you at the minute, but as we kind of go through um, the training, it'll make a bit more sense. Um, so we have an entry into service team who make the initial contact with people coming to the service um, and they triage uh, any clients and they're essentially determined are they in alcohol dependency and opiate uh, complex needs, so any kind of family risk that may be involved. Uh, we have a clinical team, um, recovery team, as in um, kind of one-to-one -one kind of key support, IPS, which is a new service in finding uh, jobs for people engaging with our service, criminal justice team who engage directly with the probation, probation services, and also a rough sleepers team that go around the city centre um, and kind of engaging people who, who may need support, who can't um, find us in, in conventional ways. So we are a team with we join up with loads of different kind of organisations within the city centre. So we work with dual diagnosis teams, mid mid referee teams. Uh, we provide stakeholder training, for example, what we're doing now, just to kind of understand uh, what we do. Uh, we have a young people service, so they kind of support anyone from the ages of nine to twenty four. Um, like I mentioned before, we have a rough sleepers team and the criminal justice teams. So we can support individuals in applying and attending detox and rehab. So we offer kind of three different forms of, of what that may look like. So home detox, so it's more risky because there's not the one-to-one -one support, but essentially if someone has a carer or family at home, they'll come in during the day to CGL, we'll support them here, and then they go back and kind of at home have that support network to be able to detox. Then we have the ambulatory de detox, which is... Um, across between one and three days, uh, the detox at home, but again, they come come to see us um, again. And then we have the inpatient detox. Um, it's the safest, but also the most expensive option. Again, service users engaging with CGL don't pay a penny. This is all kind of funded by the council, and it can range from anywhere from £2,000 to £8,000 per kind of detox. So we also support individuals in applying for rehabilit rehabilitation uh, placements uh, following the framework uh, set up by the partnerships and the commissioners. 
Um, again, re rehabs usually kind of three month period. It can be longer based on each kind of uh, situation. And a lot of people choose to kind of do outside of Coventry. So although they're engaging with us in Coventry, they can be sent to kind of different areas around the country to kind of break um, any kind of problematic reoccurrences. So we have a health and well-being department or team here. So we have a loads of kind of healthcare and well-being assistants, nurses, non-medical prescribers, and a consultant. They provide special support for people engaging with us. Um, so they kind of give full blood tests, health assessments, ECGs, uh, blood pressure, just to kind of get an overall picture of health. Uh, we offer dietary and nutrition support, wound care, uh, like I mentioned before, detox and medical assessments. Uh, and here at CGL, we are on a mission to micro eliminate hep C. So we have an award kind of winning hep C team who who will oversee um, harm reduction and things like that, which we will touch upon uh, later in the training. So we had something called the needle and syringe program, also known as needle exchange. So the main aim of the needle and string uh, program is to reduce the transmission of bloodborne viruses um, because depending on where people are in the city, they will reuse noodle, uh, needles. Uh, and what essentially happens is we we provide a service where people can come in and, and get clean equipment just to kind of eliminate all these kinds of things. So there's a list there of what we offer. So hypodermic syringes, swabs, utensils for, for preparation of any controlled drugs, citric acids, adsorbic acids, filters and water amulets. So we also give away sharp bins and things like that. There's also something else which we'll touch upon later called naloxone, which again won't make too much sense now, but it should do at the end of the session. As well as the health and well-being side of things, we will also offer group work. So as a kind of community, you can come in and we, we do kind of psychosocial uh, support. We we make um, we do day trips out. We do memorial park walks So anything to kind of help with with the, the community itself. So we have pro treatment support, online support, volunteering. So once someone has completed structured treatment, um, they can kind of continue to work with us to build new skills. Um, accessing work experience and focusing personal growth without kind of relapsing. Um, we have the Work for All IPS team. So it's an evidence-based program and it aims to help people to maintain paid employment. So they'll work with the service user to find kind of the best fit for their, for their current needs. So We'll start over. That was just a very kind of brief overview. Um, there is a more in-depth version, but I just wanted to kind of gloss over that because there's so much that we'll be covering today. So non-opiate substances awareness. So we'll be covering understanding what they what they are, um, what they look like and their effects and their dependency and the risks. So addictions and substance abuse is a very complicated subject, and it's something that scientists and psychologists are still trying to understand. Despite the difficulty in describing exactly what makes uh, people more prone to addiction than others, countless studies have found that a combination of factors can play a part, which include environment, genetics, family background and personal traits, and sometimes stress can also play a part in that. Experimenting with different substances doesn't automatically lead to addiction. However, with, when, when different factors can contribute to something, it can lead to, to addictions developing. Um, what can be said about addiction is it doesn't discriminate. It can affect all people of all ages, intelligence levels, backgrounds. Um, the signs and symptoms can vary person to person, but damaging, it's, it's all essentially damaging as an addiction. And anyone living living with it, it, it needs, it, they need professional treatment. So if everyone can get their phones or uh, smart devices, if you can scan that QR code, and then if you can just type in any non-opiate substances that you can name. So not heroin, not codeine, because they are opiates. Uh, everything else you may have heard on the street, um, for example, weed can be one. Um, so yeah, I'll give you kind of a minute to kind of get some responses in, and then we'll go from there.
Ah, so we just had a message saying some of the, uh, the sessions don't. OK, you've got to register for an account and stuff like that. OK, what we'll do is we can come back to this at another time. Um, a few people having a few issues. Uh, we do have the code at the top of the screen. Um, but if not, what we'll do is we'll, we'll come back to this. Um, so it's not a problem. So don't worry about that for now. So what I'll do, OK, the code should work. So code is at the top of the top of the screen. Bear with me a minute. Let's get it loaded up on here as well. OK, so some people don't have the option to input the code, so don't worry about this one for now. We'll 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 touch upon this later. So some non opiate substances um, include cocaine, crack, uh, ecstasy, MDMA, uh, ketamine, um, loads of kind of different amphetamines, steroids and uh, novel psychoactive substances, including spice. Um, some of you may have heard those ones. Yeah, guys, don't worry about the, the link for now. We'll, we'll come back to that another time. So moving forward, so these are the common drugs that we are seeing in the West Midlands being used at the minute. So the most prevalent amongst young adults, so people um, aged kind of 16 to 24 are, are being reported to, to be using um, a lot of these ones, more so kind of the class B and class C. Uh, men are more likely to use non-opiate drugs with 60% to 40% split between male and female users. Um, individuals from higher income backgrounds tend to have higher rates of non-opiate drug use compared to those from low level income areas. So some of you may have heard um, cocaine can be known as kind of the rich man's drug. So that's where that kind of comes from. And then there's there's some of these that you may not have heard of. So, for example, the class C, there's something called CART. So CART's a leafy green plant containing two main stimulant drugs which speed up the mind and the body. Um, it's similar to an amphetamine, but not as powerful. And it's kind of used in the Arabian and Eastern Africa Peninsula, which we're, again we're seeing more of now within the West Midlands and Coventry. So next, we're kind of going to explore um, different Class A, Class B, and Class C drugs that are are known to be used uh, widely in the West Midlands, and we are kind of seeing an influx of of new substances uh, flooding the market as well. So cocaine, which is a Class A drug. It's a white powder stimulant that's normally snorted or rubbed into the gums. So on the top picture, you can see labeled A. That's the kind of the the traditional view of what cocaine is seen as. So it's it's usually in lines or rubbed on gum, gums. Um, the second picture, labeled B, is known as crack or freebase. So this is often smoked in a pipe. Um, some people smoke it in cans if they don't have access to pipes. And withdrawal wise, it's it's psychosocial and phys uh, physical effects of anxiety, panic attacks, restlessness, um, particularly for tolerances built up. So it's being addicted to cocaine and then being go kind of going cold turkey doesn't have any implications on 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 health. It's more kind of mental mental health that it could affect. So cocaine remains the most commonly used non opiate drug with over eight hundred thousand users in England. According to the ONS report in uh, June 2022, cocaine was reported to have been used last year by at least 2% of 16 to 59 year olds and 4% of 16 to 24 year olds. So quite a big kind of statistic there. Over 4.1 million in England and Wales have used powdered cocaine in the last year. Like I said before, the powdered one is kind of more popular amongst kind of uh, casual users. Next, we have cannabis, which is a class B drug. So it's a plant based drug. It can be smoked, eaten or vaped. So when it's smoked, it's usually rolled up um, in, in the, the picture you can see labeled A, uh, usually mixed with tobacco. It can be eaten and vaped. So there's a little picture there that kind of shows what's being introduced. So THC is extracted and used in vapes or put into food. So THC and CBD are both chemical components of cannabis, but they're two very different things. So CBD is, is chemically like THC, but doesn't have the same psychoactive effects. So CBD is kind of used more within um, healthcare and things like that, specifically to stop epilepsy and those types of things, whereas THC is it g gives you that high that cannabis is kind of known as. Like I said, they're, they're 
THC and and cannabis, the the psychoactive substances, they're both highly addictive. Um, so withdrawal, again, it's all kind of mental. It can be physical in terms of anxiety, panic attacks, restlessness, sleep, eating, and memory loss, and problems. Again, if you go cold turkey from cannabis, there's not going to be any adverse health effects um, anyone experiences. So it's the most widely used with around 2 million people reporting a use. Um, it can impact your mood, sleep, memory, and appetite. And it can also, it's known to increase lung cancer. Uh, it can affect your blood pressure, um, which is kind of more harmful for people with underlying um, heart disease or, or heart implications. Um, it also increases the likeliness of de developing stuff like schizophrenia, especially if you have a family background of mental health illness um, and you start smoking in your younger years. Um, there's also reports at the minute of THC and cannabis being mixed with something called fentanyl, um, again, which we'll touch upon later. So fentanyl is a very, very dangerous substance, which is causing a lot of deaths um, all over the world at the minute. Um, in terms of the THC being used in in, in food and, and vapes, there's personal experience, which I've had in, in teaching in secondary schools where a, a year seven, so a, an 11 year old accidentally picked up his his parents, his gummies, THC gummies. So they're kind of made with, with cannabis and un, unknowingly he gave them out to a class. So a group of 11 year olds have just taken THC for the first time. An ambulance was called and it was, it was a very, very kind of big safeguarding issue in terms of that. So we are seeing within the West Midlands them being more easily accessed. So things like the dark web or ordering online or even in some cases ordering it off Instagram and Facebook, we're seeing a big kind of influx in, in, in the THC edibles. So next we have a, a class C, so steroids or performance en enhancing drugs. So this can be used either as tablets or injected liquid that some people take to build muscle or improve uh, sport performance. So using steroid either as tablets or injections can give you high blood pressure and increase your risk of illness and death due to liver failure, stroke or a heart attack. Inject injecting any drugs, even steroids, can damage your veins and cause ulcers and gangrene, particularly dirty needles or poor injecting techniques. Sharing needles, uh, syringes with other injecting people can spread HIV, Hep C, and other in, uh, kind of problems. Steroids are also linked with mental health uh, issues. Again, we're seeing that in the younger generation who are being exposed to things online. So, for example, Instagram accounts who are who are obviously taking performance enhancing drugs, but are kind of seen as natural, which is giving body dysmorphia to the younger generations, which is kind of increasing. The, the use of, of steroids. So withdrawal it can cause depression due to the psycho, psych, psychological dependency that develops, um, loss of sex drive and general interest uh, overall. So males specifically, again, the younger generations are experience um, uh, erection problems, growing breasts, becoming sterile, loss of hair, uh, lots of development of, of really heavy acne, which can lead to scarring over life. Females risk uh, extra facial hair, loss of hair, a deeper voice, shrinking in breasts, as well as risking, again, acne, uh, increased risk of menstrual problems and changes in sex drive. So next we have new psychoactive substances. So this is kind of new. They begin to appear in the UK around 2009, 2010. Um, they're normally kind of sold online until very recently. They were, they were being sold in shops. Um, and they're very kind of bright, distinctive in terms of their advertising and packaging um, and have a very kind of confusing ingredient list. So they contain one or more chemical uh, that produce similar effects to drugs like cocaine, cannabis and ecstasy. And they used to be known as legal highs. They can come in powders, pills or capsules. Um, they tend to be snorted or swallowed. While smoking mixtures can also be smoked in in, in, a, in a spliff, similar to uh, similar to cannabis, which is what again we're seeing around the West Midlands and Coventry. So things like you may have heard of black mamba, spice, um, those kind of names are new psychoactive substances which are causing a lot of issues. Uh, withdrawal wise, some people feel anxious soon soon after they stop taking it. Um, you can 
can get severe withdrawal symptoms in heavy use, um, and it can be particular, particularly dangerous um, if you're taking it with other other drugs. So if you are taking cocaine and then taking spice, it can it can lead to some really bad things. And this one is again the kind of the the, the newest emerging drug that we are seeing um, the use of. So nitrous oxide, also known as NOS, is a class C. So it's a colorless gas sold in canisters. It's usually inhaled using a balloon. It's commonly found in those kind of small pressurized metal canisters. And you may have seen them um, on the sides of the roads or in car parks or outside bars or nightclubs. So if you take too much nit nitrix, uh, nitrous oxide, sorry, you risk falling unconscious and or suffocating from the lack of oxygen. People have died this way. It can cause dizziness, uh, which might make you act carelessly or dangerously. There have been recent reports of car accidents um, that, that people have been using NOS with. So it's it kind of, it's it's in the media at the minute. Someone in the comments just put hippie crack. That's another way of kind of um, categorizing it. It's known as uh, charges, whippets, laughing gas, uh, NOS with a Z. So there's, there's loads of kind of different names for a lot of these drugs. And again, with each emerging generation, the names change. So it's always kind of hard to keep on top of what, what people may call these things. Um, so NOS is most popular amongst teenagers, young adults, festival goers, people go to clubs or raves. Um, they normally kind of, the effects only last for a few minutes. Um, it can, again, like I said, it can cause dizziness uh, as well as euphoria. People giggle after taking it, light headaches. Um, it's quite addictive because it's such a short-lived effect. People keep taking it again and again and again just to kind of get to the same level they were. Um, as of 2016, uh, it was covered by the Psychoactive Substances Act and is illegal to supply for its, for its effects now. Um, we are kind of seeing in some corner shops that it's kind of been sold under the counter, but there have been crackdowns in, by the government in terms of kind of finding these these places that do sell them. Long term use um, is associated with vitamin B12 deficiency, anemia, um, and tinnitus. So there's been some cases where people have paralysed and, and have died from using um, not uh, NOS. So next, we have a small video that kind of outlines some of the dangers of, of what people may face if they are taking nitrous oxide. So kind of any of these non-opiate substances, um, it can exacerbate mental health problems or cause long-term disabilities like you've just seen. It's also you know, 
10 times more likely to have a car crash when kind of being on these things and it could lead to uh, difficulty in learning in younger years as well. So we'll move on next to drug classification. So it's a way to organize drugs into categories in terms of effects. Um, classifying drugs by chemical similarities is useful because drugs uh, that are chemically similar often have similar impacts and risk. Despite these generalities, um, chemically similar drugs may have different effects and different legal impacts. So for example, somebody who's six foot seven and weighs maybe 20 stone is going to be affected differently to somebody who's maybe five foot one and, and seven stone. So it, it can vary in person to person. So start off with stimulant type drugs. So they can be classed as a drug that speeds up messages traveling between the brain and body. They can make a person feel more awake, alert, confident, and energetic. So popular types, amphetamines, speed, um, caffeine, cocaine, ice, also known as crystal meth, cart, and nicotine, often kind of seen as party drugs. Um, so people are more likely kind of to experiment with things like this. Um, make you feel more uh, euphoric, uh, fast thinking, sharp, limitless and confidence. The effects can last longer uh, than a couple of hours. People tend to redose to keep the buzz going. Um, if injected, it, it will be taken into the bloodstream immediately um, and a few minutes longer if snorted or swallowed. So the effects are, are a variety of different things. So it can damage the heart and nervous system, numb blue cold fingers, lead to addiction, stroke and ultimately death. Um, it can again the effects can alter altered person to person so taking a regular dose of caffeine or taking amphetamine amphetamines is two kind of different things um, so although they are in the same classification they can have different effects so depressant type drugs so depressant substances reduce arousal and stimulation they affect the central nervous system slowing down messages between the brain and the body so popular types include alcohol, liquid ecstasy, benzos, blues, roofies, GHB and kava. So illicit or fake benzos um, have been found in, to contain some harmful substances that are causing hospitalizations and deaths in the UK. So this is kind of touching on, on like I mentioned before, the fentanyl side of things. Again, we'll, we'll explore that further uh, later on in the training. Um, it can take 30 minutes to kick in and it can last between one and four hours. Um, taking depressant type drugs can make you feel relaxed, sleepy, calm, disorientated, lethargic or drowsy and very dangerous when mixed with alcohol. So if you were taking alcohol and then benzos, it can lead to, to some, some really bad health implications, um, it can lead to overdose risks, long term mental health issues, fits, tremors, depression and even death. Next, we have psychedelics or hallucinogenic type of drugs. So psychedelics, aka hallucinogens, are a psychoactive substance that produce changes in perception, mood, and cognitive processes. So popular types are LSD, DMT, shrooms, magic mushrooms, and a few of the kind of names that may be out on the streets. They uh, induce feelings of enlightenment and detachment. They can make you hallucinate, see, hear, and, and and hear things that are not actually there. In some cases, you could smell, touch, or taste things that aren't actually there, so they can be quite dangerous. They're usually ingested, sniffed, sprayed, or dissolved under the tongue or inside of the cheek. The effects can last anywhere from six to 10 hours. Again, depending on person to person, it could affect someone more than it could affect someone else. Um, so the reported effects include seizures, sickness, tremors, heart issues, panic attack, loss of consciousness, mental health problems, and insomnia. So different stages of kind of non-opiate um, drug use. So we've got the five here, experimental, recreational, chaotic, problematic, and dependent. So we can look at what the some of the signs may be here. So experimental is someone using substances on a very limited number of occasions out of curiosity. Um, use is generally kind of social and it's limited to a few exposures so there's no real pattern of use recreational so someone who uses substances from time to time as a leisure activity um, so again 
more than the experimental side so somebody who may be going to festivals on a regular occasion is it's like that so the use is irregular and, and infrequent but they do kind of use it whilst they engage in certain activities then we have chaotic so someone continued to use a substance unpredictably without pre-planning and with little or no regard of consequences beyond that of the effect of the substance then we have problematic uh, when someone uh, risks inherent use and goes beyond the individual's ability to manage them. And then we have dependence, so someone using substances daily due to physical and or psychological attachment to the drugs. So the dependent kind of side of things is, is regular use and the user will become emotionally or physically attached. Um, and essentially it's, it's the user's main priority is, is getting that kind of high or that fix. So when should you, what should you do, sorry, if you think someone is using a non-opiate substances and is affecting their work? So again, it's kind of, it kind of links into all kinds of forms of, of talking to somebody you may be kind of managing or responsible for. So before approaching the employee, ensure there's valid objective evidence or observation suggesting substance use. So this could be based on performance issues, behavioural changes, safety concerns or reports from different colleagues. Avoid jumping to conclusions based solely on rumours or assumptions. So you could start off by reviewing the company's policies on substance use, both legal and illegal. This would help ensure that the conversation aligns with your organisation's protocols and procedures and protects both the employee and the company from any legal complications. So then you can kind of next step would be to create a private and supportive environment. So when addressing the employee, you can schedule a private meeting, ensuring you've got kind of the space to talk and it's all confidential. It's important to foster a non-judgmental and supportive atmosphere rather than being confrontational or accusatory. So at the end of the day, the person you are kind of talking to is, is human at the end of the day. And like we said, with addiction, there's a load of different factors that may kind of feed into feed into why somebody's taken any kind of substances. So focus on performance and behaviour, not on the accusations. You can start the conversation by discussing any performance issues or observed behaviours that has raised concerns. This opens the conversations in a way that invites the employee to share their perspective without feeling directly accused of substance use. And you can also remind them that your organization takes well-being of the employees very seriously and you have the resources available if they do need any help again we're going to kind of touch upon this later in real life examples in in ways you can start conversations and support support people in, in that sense so a few things to remember so always listen to all the responses and observe body language so if they do admit to using substances um, again follow the kind of policies if it is affecting their workloads um, and then you can refer them to special treatments programs. So, for example, us, Change Where I Live. If they deny it, but the concern remains, monitor the situation discreetly. Regardless of the outcome, um, always document the meeting, including what was discussed and any kind of actions taken in terms of further steps. And then follow up with the employee to monitor their progress and ensure they are feeling supported. Again, this kind of helps reinforce any kind of company or organization policy to, to employee welfare. So next we have a short animation on, on addiction and how it can affect people and how it does kind of affect um, people who are, for example, someone who is starting to use, let's say, cocaine for the first time and how they can become addicted and how it can affect them.
just going to stop it there so you can kind of see the the process of of kind of chasing the high and it becoming less and less effective each time a substance is consumed so it's kind of very very similar in terms of alcohol dependency um, this is kind of a very kind of visual version of that um, but like we said before addiction can affect anybody um, from all walks of life from all social classes so it's always important to treat that person as as a human being at the end of the day um, it can happen to kind of any of us it can happen to any of our family members or friends or or people that we may know um, so again it's about being human and and, and under, understanding that it can it, it can affect everyone so we'll move on to the opiate awareness so very kind of different now to what we kind of just covered now um, in terms of substances so kind of cannabis weed alcohol sorry not alcohol cannabis weed and um, um, stuff like ecstasy things like that so this is very kind of very very different so we'll cover what opiates are um, what they what the effects are um, opioid dependency and treatment and then um, support pathways and some conversations as well so what are opiates and what are opioids? So two different words. So opiates and opioids are two different classes of drugs that are often confused and used interchangeably in everyday conversation. It's important to understand the differences between the, the medications and, and how they can affect your body because they are very, very, very different. So on the surface, both opiates and opioids are not narcotic pain relievers. So opium, is a natural substance derived from the poppy plant that contains potent alkaloid components called opiates. Opioids, on the other hand, are artificially produced drugs often made in a lab or synthesized from opium. So kind of one's more natural and one's kind of more um, factory made, for example. So there's a little kind of image there to, to show the, the differences between the two. So it's Opium is, is is a medicine that's used be it's been used to relieve pain for for centuries. Um, UK has the highest consumption of prescription opioids globally per per capita, and it can be categorised into numerous different kind of areas. Um, and here are a few of those. So there's a little diagram there to kind of show the natural process from opium, and the natural kind of opioids such as morphine or codeine. Uh, and then the the synthetic ones, which are in the orange, which are kind of the 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 ones that are being abused more so. So the opioid family of drugs includes natural, synthetic, and semi-synthetic opioids. Opiates such as morphine and codeine are natural opioids found in the opium poppy. Synthetic opioids such as methadone are chemically made. Heroin is a semi-synthetic opioid. It's made from morphine that has been chemically processed. So we're going to a bit more de detail now. So morphine is a powerful opiate chemical found naturally in the opium poppy plant. It's, it is considered the prototypical opiate. Morphine serves as the foundation for the development of other opioids. It's commonly used in uh, medical settings to, to, tr to treat severe pain, especially in post-operative or palliative care for cancer patients. So morphine is extremely addictive and studies have shown it to be just as addicted as, as heroin. Um, both drugs are described as causing extreme euphoria, feelings of inspiration or relaxation. So over 10% of the population has used morphine at least once. So again, more so in the medical kind of setting. Next, we have another natural opiate, so codeine. So codeine is a mild opiate derived from the opium poppy plant. It's frequently used as a cough suppressant. Um, it's commonly included in prescription cough syrups and pain relievers. So it's usually combined with uh, ibuprofen a lot of the time. Next, we have thiamine. So another natural opiate. So it's originating from the, the poppy plant again. Um, it has minim minimal kind of properties unlike morphine and codeine. Um, it also has a stimulatory effect rather than the depressant. It's a precursor in manufacturing semi-synthetic opioids such as oxys or hydrocone. Again, we'll touch upon them shortly. Well, this medication here is not kind of used therapeutically. It is the main alkaloid extracted from the Persian poppies, and it can be kind of converted into a variety of different things, including semi semi-synthetic opioids. 
So for example, this is one, hydrocorridine. So it's a pre prescription and it's typically prescribed to treat moderate to severe pain. Um, it's a prescription drug uh, abusers involved in taking them more than more than prescribed, taking them beyond their prescribed time frame, and taking them in a way that they weren't intended. So if someone's breaking down the tablets and, and it's snoring or injecting them. So the long term abuse not only changes the brain functions, but can also have lasting effects on mood and thought patterns. Prolonged abusers are, are likely to suffer insomnia, liver or kidney disease and depression. Um, so when the body's unable to kind of process the drugs, the, the breathing and heart rate plummets. And in just a few minutes, someone overdosing can, can stop breathing, um, depriving their brain of oxygen. So this is kind of there are lots of people who go into hospital who, let's say, for example, have a car crash and they are on, on, on morphine, um, but they don't necessarily become addicted, whereas the kind of semi-synthetic ones are, are more commonly abused. So these are the, the types we are seeing out on the streets a lot of the time as well that are being abused or sold illegally. Another semi-synthetic opioid is heroin. So in its pure form, heroin is a fine white bitter tasting powder that dissolves in water. So it's, it's often mixed up and then put into needles. Um, when it's sold on the street, its color and consistency vary depending on how it's been made or what additives it's been cut with. It can be taken by injecting, um, smoking or snorting. It's very, very easy to overdose from heroin um, and it kills more people in the UK than any other illegal uh, drugs. So heroin deaths have more than doubled since 2012. Uh, and that's not necessarily just because more people are using heroin. It's because of a, a factor that's kind of come into play um, since then. So the estimated number of active heroin users in the UK is almost 300,000. So the additives I was talking about why in terms of why people may be dying more so in the last kind of 12 years um, is because of the additives that they're using to dilute heroin. So sometimes it's, it's it's diluted with sugar, caffeine or other substances such as like ground up paracetamol and things like that. Um, the additives don't fully dissolve in, in the water, so they can clog up blood vessels that can lead to lung, kidney or uh, brain infections. Um, they can result in infection, the destruction of like kind of the vital organs, so the, the lungs, kidneys and things like that. So heroin is very, very addictive and its withdrawal is extremely painful. It's very easy to overdose from heroin, which kills more people than any other drug in the UK. Um, again, the kind of thought process is if, if someone's taking heroin and they go cold turkey, that they could die from what they're feeling. Um, they can they can experience severe kind of withdrawals and and not be very well, but they, it doesn't lead to death if if it's essentially stopped. So, what the problem is, what we're seeing currently in the West Midlands uh, and. To be fair, not just the West Midlands, all over the world, more so in America. So it started in America a few years ago, and now it's kind of moved over to the UK. Is something called fentanyl, which I've men mentioned a few times. So fentanyl is is used to cut with heroin or other street drugs. It could also be made into tablets and look like pre uh, prescription medication. A lot of people overdose on on drugs because they don't know that it's been mixed with heroin. Uh, sorry, with fentanyl. So of, often heroin and fentanyl are, are mixed together. Um, we're going to explore why that is as well in the next section. So we're seeing trends that the US kind of experienced five, six years ago. And that has now kind of filtered over to the UK because it's so easy kind of produced and it's so cheap to make. So fentanyl, it's a, a synthetic opioid. Again, it's not a naturally occurring substance. It's made in a, in a factory. And it's 50 to 100 times stronger than morphine and was created to, to use in a medical setting to, tr to, uh, to treat severe pains. It's recently been mixed with other illicit drugs to increase potency. Uh, because there's no official oversight on the quality of it, um, a lot of these, a lot of the pills contain lethal doses um, with none of, of the promised drugs. So somebody might be going in to, to pick up heroin off their dealer. Um, but it's actually just pure fentanyl, which will, will which will lead to death uh, or an overdose. Um, there's a significant risk uh, that illegal drugs have been intentionally contaminated with fentanyl. So the whole drug market has kind of changed. Uh, fentanyl is now not just found in heroin. It's been found in cocaine. It's been found in some uh, cannabis. It's been found in some THC vapes. So it's 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 totally kind of uh, flooded flooded the market in terms of any kind of drug use. 
So there's a little kind of indication on on the different uh, strengths, essentially. So that much heroin is equivalent to those kind of few flakes of fentanyl. So as you can imagine, someone who's going to be taking the heroin dose, if that was pure fentanyl, it's likely that they will die. Um, and this is because in 2022, the Taliban regained control of Afghanistan and it's reduced their export of opium by 95%. Because of the lack of product coming in from, from Asia now, um, it's its potency and low cost drug dealers just they mix fentanyl with everything um like i said before including heroin meth cocaine um and it's increasing the likelihood of a fatal overdose the us was the first to experience the drug market being flooded and now like i said before we are seeing that kind of coming into the uk and now into the rest of europe so 136 people a day in america have been dying from from synthetic opioids being cut with with fentanyl um, back in 2002, the Russian military used to use fentanyl um, against uh, people they were they were kind of at odds with. So there was an instance where there was uh, terrorists holding hostages in Moscow, uh, and they flooded the 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 theater with a, a a powdered version of fentanyl, hoping to kind of knock them all out. Um, but in reality, all 127 hostages died. And this kind of shows how dangerous uh, fentanyl is because it will it will just affect everyone the same way. It's that powerful. So there are a variety of different kind of risks um, when using opioids or heroin. So it's not being the substances that you thought it was, e.g. fentanyl being mixed with a heroin. It can be very, very dangerous with alcohol as alcohol is a suppressant uh, and it's dip depressant. So it will slow down kind of the brain function and, and breathing and things like that. It's dangerous when mixed with other drugs and it's it risks when someone is relapsing, there's a significant chance in uh, they'll overdose due to their tolerance. So what we kind of seen here within CGL is if someone is was taking heroin and they got sent to prison and now that they've come out, they'll usually kind of take less heroin um, because, again, they know their tolerance isn't as strong. So even though they're taking less heroin, because it's been mixed with fentanyl, their body has no kind of a blocker for that. So it just kind of leads to an overdose and in the end death. So there's a kind of few different signs in terms of um, spotting someone with, with opioid uh, overdoses. So their pupils will be, kind of become small. Um, they'll start falling asleep or lose consciousness. Their breathing will slow down rapidly. Um, they'll often kind of choke or you'll hear gurgling sounds. Their skin will go cold and blue um, and the, the nails or lips will also kind of change colour as well. So there is something called naloxone, which we give out as a service. It's free to kind of get the training and get naloxone kits. And what that essentially does is it blocks the opioid receptors in the, in the brain and it can reverse um, someone having an overdose. Although it can reverse it, medical attention is still needed. So it's only a kind of a temporary blocker, and it gives the it gives the kind of um, it gives you time to call medical professionals. So people usually experience long term effects of using heroin. Um, it quickly opioids quickly break down the immune system. Uh, it leaves users sickly, extremely thin, and ultimately leads to death if continued use. So here's a a list of few other uh, problems that may occur when when using opioids or heroin. So, in terms of kind of helping with with, with people who are um, dependent on opioids, um, the management of opioid dependency requires medical, social, and psycho psychological treatment across a multidisciplinary team. Um, so, not just one person can kind of help somebody in terms of like their, their dependence on opioids. So it should be initiated under supervision of a appropriately qualified prescriber or, or a doctor. Again, we have these on site at CGL. So when we are supporting someone who may have opioid dependency, it's all kind of done medically as well. It's not just a one-to-one a -one with a social worker. There's a big kind of medical team behind any, any decisions made. So some of the stuff that's given out in terms of stopping uh, the dependency on opioids are something called methadone. So it's a synthetic opioid that's used to use uh, chronic pain. And it's also, um, it helps 
treat addiction to heroin and other opioids. So it's to prescribe for daily use. The medicine relieves cravings and removes withdrawal symptoms. And there's also one called bubufenine, and it relieves withdrawal symptoms from other opioids and induces some euphoria, but it blocks the ability for many other opioids, including heroin, to cause an effect. So a lot of the service users who come to CGL are less likely to use this because, unfortunately, they will still take their, their methadone and then some heroin because a lot of the time the, the, the levels of, of methadone aren't correct. It takes a little while to, to understand how much methadone a person needs. And in that kind of intermediate time, they'll take heroin, whereas they won't take this medication because it has no effects when taking the heroin. So it's not as popular as the other one. And uh, that's because it, the the opioids won't be able to bind with the receptors if used. So support and start conversation. So this is kind of a scenario based um, kind of a few slides to help start those conversations that uh, if you are worried somebody is kind of using opioids or, or heroin and things like that. So Jane is a valued employee who has recently been showing signs of potential drug use, including erratic behavior, drowsiness, and poor job performance, where historically she's excelled. Um, you've observed these signs and support that she may, she may be kind of using drugs or be using drugs in work hours. So today, Jane arrives at work appearing disorientated and you're concerned about her well-being and the safety of others. So start by pulling Jane in a private setting uh, where you can have a calm conversation without interruptions or embarrassment. Ensure Jane feels safe and comfortable before in the discussion. So again, like I said before, at the end of the day, everybody's human and you don't know what they're going through and what's led them to those kind of those decisions. So start the conversation with empathy, show concern for, for Jane's well-being, avoid accusations and focus on how she feels and what might be going on. Um, and that's better than kind of jumping to conclusions about substances. So, for example, you could say, Jane, I've noticed you seem a bit off today and I'm concerned about you. Is everything OK? And that will work better than saying we need to have a talk. I think you have a problem, which is kind of very direct and and gives a ne negative connotation straight away. So you can use reflective listening, uh, encourage Jane to talk by reflecting her words and concerns. For example, if Jane says I'm really tired, you could respond with, it sounds like you've been having a tough time lately. Can you tell me more about it? What's going on? So again, it's allowing the conversation to kind of flow without breaking off yes or no questions. So once rapport is established, um, you can gently raise awareness, expressing your concerns about the behavior and job performance without blaming uh, her directly. So for example, you could say, I've noticed lately that um, it's hard for you to focus at work and today you seem particularly out of sorts. I'm worried that whatever is going on might be affecting your health and your ability to do your job safely. Um, so that's a way better way of kind of starting that conversation. I've just seen a message from Laura pop up. So yeah, if, if you guys got other things to go to, feel free. Um, the session is being recorded and unfortunately we have gone a bit over, um, but I, I'll look forward to kind of hearing, hearing in terms of feedback and, and anything like that. So if Jane denies or becomes defensive, um, you could avoid arguing and roll with the resistance. Instead, acknowledge your feelings and gently explore further. So you could say, I understand this might be hard for you to talk about. Um, it's not about blame. I'm just here to help um, and figure out what might be the best way of you moving forward. So you can reinforce any desire Jane expresses for change, even if it's very small, minute. You can offer her support and resources without pressuring her into immediate decisions. So you could say, it sounds like you're open to talking more about this, uh, and that's great. Uh, what support do you think you would need uh, to kind of work better and, and support your health? So again, it's all about kind of having those, those gentle conversations uh, in terms of opening up a conversation rather than just directly blaming, blaming somebody for something. So a few things to remember. So again, time and place is very, very important. Always have a neutral atmosphere away from others um, so no one can kind of hear your conversations. And remember, it's a sensitive subject for some. Um, you have to expect the response to be emotional, especially if, if somebody is using, for example, heroin. Um, there's obviously some something going on on there. So remember to be, be empathetic, uh, have an understanding and calm approach. Uh, you want to 
encourage the individual to engage. You don't want to anger or upset them. And use open ended questioning. Let the other person do all the talking. Um, and that way you can demonstrate active listening. Um, let them all feel kind of heard. Uh, be prepared. Um, are you confident in having this conversation with that person? Um, and do you know where you can signpost them if they do kind of need extra support? So next is a short video in terms of, of, of how kind of addiction again works. I've been saying throughout this training that everyone's human and it's quite an interesting uh, analysis of, of what drug use is, is like. So yeah, it's quite interesting in terms of, of how addiction can kind of be solved as well in terms of um, environmental factors and support. Okay, so next, I'm aware that a lot of you guys have to go soon as well. Um, so I'll kind of squeeze this in as quick as I can. So we've just got the alcohol and then kind of um, the brief interventions and, and awareness in, in terms of supporting people. Um, and then we'll be over. So I'm assuming probably about 20 more minutes to get through this section. So we'll look at types of drinks, drinkers, the risk and what dependency looks like, alcohol and its prevalence, and the continued long-term effects and damage, and where to reverse someone and, and medical interventions. So harmful drinking is the biggest risk factor for death, ill health and disability amongst 15 to 49 year olds in the UK, and the fifth biggest risk factor across all ages. So for those people who don't know what alcohol is, uh, we mentioned it earlier, it's a depressant of the central nervous system, meaning it slows down activity. Uh, many people think that alcohol is a pick-me-up, 
uh, and the experience is that initially but when you begin to drink more and more it causes them to become more animated and less reserved essentially what starts to happen is um, the, the continued link of alcohol in the brain it as it enters the brain it slows down everything so for example if someone has two shots of vodka for example um, they're going to get a bit more animated a bit more kind of lively but then what kind of happens if they keep taking more and more and more is I'm sure you've kind of seen on the, on the streets people experience a lot of these kind of effects so the altered speech hazy thought processes slowed down reaction times dulled hearing uh, vision problems foggy memory and things like that that's all down to how slow down slow the the brain activity kind of gets so there's three kind of um areas in terms of of alcohol and and, and drinking types so hazardous drinking so that's defined as the quantity or, or pattern of alcohol consumption that increases someone's risk of harm then we have harmful drinking. So that's defined as alcohol consumption that results in actual adverse events. So physical or psychological harm from alcohol. And then dependent drinking. Um, so this is a development of behavioral or cognitive psychosocial symptoms after repeated alcohol use. Um, it's also increased alcohol tolerance and a physical withdrawal reaction when alcohol uh, use is stopped. Dependency can be both, both physical and psychological and psychosocial. Um, so essentially, if you think what I've been saying in this training was if you're taking non-opiate drugs and you stop, there's no kind of risk to your health, like you won't die from withdrawal and same for heroin. Whereas if you are a dependent alcohol drinker and you have been drinking alcohol, stopping straight away can lead to death so it's really kind of important that you get support or you give support to somebody who may be dependent drinking so for example this is a little kind of diagram showing how many units are within a kind of standard drink so a single shot of of spirit at 40 percent is is a unit um, of kind of an average pint of lagers 2.8 units um, so the recommended amount is anywhere from kind of 10 to 14 units max a week, which kind of equates to the same as a bottle of wine. So anyone kind of drinking more than a bottle of wine is over the recommended kind of prescribed allowance from the government. So here's another kind of uh, graph just to kind of show what we just spoke about. So 60% of the population is, is in lower risk, 20% is increased risk and 10% are the highest risk. Uh, and then since the pandemic about four or five years ago, these numbers have kind of increased. Uh, but we have seen that around 10% of people abstain completely from alcohol, uh, and that's ma mainly due to religious beliefs. So in terms of um, people aged 16 and over and, and the kind of hazardous drinking levels, and you can kind of see um, the kind of ethnic minorities and how alcohol can affect them. So in 2019, a study found ethnic minorities have lower levels of alcohol consumption compared to white British groups, no matter what the generation. But the gap is narrowed among second generation ethnic minorities. Um, so in a lot of kind of cultures or, or ethnic minorities, alcohol is seen as a taboo subject. Um, however, there is a large amount of consumption that's not kind of recorded because, again, the, the taboo of coming forward for people who may be consuming alcohol in, in certain cultures. So why is alcohol the most consumed substance uh, in the world? So about 2.4 billion people worldwide consume alcohol. Uh, that's out of a population of 8.2 billion. So that's almost one in four people uh, consume alcohol generally. So the historical significance of it. So alcohol has been consumed for thousands of years and often integrated into culture and religious rituals. Wine, for example, was central to ancient Greek and uh, Roman ceremonies and continues to be significant in some uh, other religious practices. It's also used for social bonding, so alcohol is often seen as a social lubricant, helping to ease interactions, reduce inhibitions and foster a sense of camaraderie. Um, so if you think of like formal meetups uh, or, or casual meetups, sports events, it's often kind of linked with alcohol because it's it creates that bonding environment. So we also have celebration and tradition. So in many societies, alcohol is associated with celebration and milestones. 
Um, so, for example, champagne at weddings, toasts, um, things like New Year's Eve or Christmas, alcohol is very kind of entwined in, in, in the cultural expectation. Um, so drinking alcohol is often seen as, as normative behavior in most cultures. So refusing to drink alcohol in cer certain settings can be perceived as unsocial or antisocial. So it's it's quite unusual to think that just turning down something can be can be seen as an antisocial thing. So marketing and commercial influences. So alcohol, the industry is a powerful economic force with extensive marketing that reinforces its role in social occasions. Advertising often links alcohol to ideas of fun, success and sophistication, further embedding it into our cultural practices. Um, so again, it's, it's a massively abused substance, both worldwide and in the UK. Uh, ease of accessibility is uh, quite a big thing. So you can go to corner shops or supermarkets that are open 24 hours and alcohol is always being sold. Um, however, in other places uh, within the EU, uh, what they've started to do now is after 10.30, supermarkets aren't legally allowed to sell alcohol. So the, the, that kind of section will be blocked off and that kind of is hoping to minimise any, any harm uh, going forward. So why do people drink? You can see a few reasons here. Um, again, it's it's very very dependent on on the person and their and their situation. Uh, but if someone is drinking to avoid withdrawal, that's when it gets really kind of dangerous. Um, so alcohol withdrawal can range from a mild and uncomfortable disorder, uh, getting to kind of serious life threatening conditions. So the kind of the lower level stuff is changes in sleep changes in mood and fatigue that can last up to a few months. So 24% of adults in the UK um, overdrink the recommended amount. So men are again recommended 14 units, whereas women is around 10 units. Um, and, and a standard bottle of red wine is about 10 to 12 units out of 13%. So again, one bottle of wine a week is is kind of the max amount in terms of units that people should be consuming. So when does um, alcohol become problematic? So if health problems occur associated with alcohol use, so kidney and liver problems, things like that, if it's affecting families, partners, children, livelihood, occupations or studying, and legal consequences such as drink driving. So the RSC did a, a, a survey in 2013 and 7% of people are basically told the RSC that they, they drink drive. The figure is actually meant to be a bit more than that because obviously people won't want to come forward all the time or don't fill out these forms or surveys. So it, it's quite a big concerning amount of people that may be kind of drink driving as a result of, of being uh, addicted or dependent to alcohol. So more kind of things to look out with if, if somebody is struggling with alcohol. So you may see changes uh, appearing over a period of time, changing in behavior or appearance, uh, not caring for themselves or their home environment, rapid or slurred speech. They may seem forgetful, confused or irrational, unreliable. They may be missing hospital appointments or things like that. They may be anxious, indecisive or lacking confidence in social settings. If you've noticed they've got uh, injuries on their bodies due to falls. Um, some people become antisocial and, and isolate themselves and then financial difficulties as well. So alcohol misuse is estimated to cost the NHS 3.5 billion per year and it's that can range from obviously treatment in terms of liver or, or heart problems or things like that to antisocial behaviours, to car accidents, to, to all the kind of branches that alcohol misuse may touch. So here's a quick diagram in terms of how alcohol doesn't just affect the, the liver or kidney, it affects the entire body. Um, so it, from skin to, to your heart, to, to your brain, to your eyes, everything is, is affected essentially by, by alcohol. So, for example, your lungs are affected. If you drink alcohol heavily, you can become prone to lung infections. Uh, it can lead to pneumonia and, and collapsed lungs and things like that. So here's a list of some short term and long term effects of drinking. So, again, there's a variety of different kind of things that the, the alcohol misuse may branch out to. So, for example, 
uh, STIs. If you're not in the right state, once you've had had too much to drink, you can make decisions that aren't the best. It can lead to things like that. And again, this also plays on the cost on the NHS. So the alcohol really kind of feeds into a, a whole array of different problems. So support and starting conversations. So just a quick hypothetical situation here. So Ray works full time as a te team leader in a call center and you are his line manager. Lately, he's been coming into work later than usual and is avoiding speaking to you in the mornings. Ray's starting to look different. He's usually smartly dressed, but his clothes look creased and he's unshaven. Uh, when you try and speak to him around lunchtime, he seems tired and short tempered. You've spoken to him about his workload, uh, but he is, insists he is managing. Someone in Ray's team has let you know that they saw him drinking a bottle of vodka outside work and they've seen on his social media that he split up with his partner. So like I said before, you need to always find a good time and place to kind of talk, uh, somewhere confidential, somewhere quiet. Give yourselves plenty of time to chat. Try not to talk after a long day or if someone's in a rush. Um, begin with explaining your concerns again and try and open up discussion. Try and avoid the yes, no kind of answers or questions. So you could say, I've noticed something recently and I'd like if we could have a chat about it. And that's better than saying we need to talk. I think you have a problem. So you can talk about specific times you've been concerned um, and the person you're talking to might not have realized something is wrong uh, and examples can help them understand your worries um, but you've got to avoid sounding like you've been watching them and kind of making notes on on every movement that they make so ask open questions that don't just have the yes or no answer like i mentioned before so how have you been feeling recently when you've had a drink and that will keep the conversation going then do you think you're drinking too much and then try and end the conversation by discussion of the next steps. Um, ask for their thoughts instead of telling them what you think. So should we talk to somebody instead of I think you should talk to somebody? So that kind of that gives them the idea that you are there to support them as well. You're not just having this initial conversation and let them go on their own and dealing with the problems. And obviously, sometimes the conversation, they may not react well to that conversation that you brought up. But again, it's it's something that needs to be addressed in, in a work setting is it, if it is affecting um, kind of day to day operations or their role. So when you should refer to a specialist, so if someone is physically dependent on alcohol, they must not stop drinking abruptly. Sudden cessation could be fatal. One in 25 people die from alcohol withdrawal. So like I've been saying since the alcohol awareness stuff, um, if you are dependent on drinking and then you suddenly stopped, it can it can lead to death. And there are reports of people dying from from cessation. So 76,000 uh, men and 45,000 women in the UK were treated for alcohol dependency in the UK in 2023. So these aren't people who are casually having a drink or, or recreationally having a drink. These are people who are dependent on day to day drinking. So it's advised that people should not stop drinking without help from an alcohol or drug treatment service or a doctor, especially if they drink more than 30 units a day, which is equivalent to one bottle of, of spirit, uh, 70 CL. So something, again, a bottle of vodka at 40% alcohol. If someone's drinking three bottles of wine a day, more than 12 pints of normal strength beer, seven cans of super lager or four liters of strong cider, they shouldn't stop either if they have epilepsy, unstable liver disease, have seizures or have hallucinated when trying to withdraw from alcohol. So if, if people are trying to stop without the support and they haven't experienced those symptoms, it's really, really important that they seek professional help. Um, so people have seen, heard and even felt things when they are withdrawing. So it can be really, really dangerous in terms of not only to that person, but the, the people around them. So we have a pharmaceutical intervention which helps assist in the effectiveness of the psychosocial elements. So alcohol users can be prescribed two types of medication that we'll cover in a second. Um, so alcohol users may other, other they also might have like um, they might be addicted to heroin and be alcoholics at the same time. Um, so in that instance, they can still get treatment for both substance abuse. So they can get methadone for the heroin and they can get a comprisate for the alcohol dependency. 
Um, again, it's it's all medically prescribed and it's looked at in depth. They're not just kind of they don't come into service and then they're, they're not just given a pack of tablets. They are seen by medical professionals and it's an assessed kind of um, an, an assessed prescription essentially. So one of the, the most used ones here at CGL is something called a Comprezone. So it helps helps a person reduce impulsive behavior and in turn reduces craving for alcohol. It works by balancing the levels of naturally occurring chemicals in the brain, which have become unbalanced by the heavy use of alcohol. So it's something called B1, which is your, your brain produces naturally. But when you start drinking alcohol, that kind of stops and that that can uh, increase the forgetfulness and things like that. This helps reduce reduce the, the any problems linked with that. So the support CGL can offer. So there's different ways you can refer to us for for somebody else. Um, so a professional referral can be made, but consent needs to be to be given by the person who's being referred. Um, people can log into our website, which Laura will share. Um, you can give us a call directly on the phone numbers. You can come in on person uh, and have a chat. Um, so the triage team will will see you on the same day and they can kind of assess your your dependency or, or what, what you may need going forward. Um, so we use something called, as well as the medical side of things, we use something called brief interventions. So it's a technique to initiate change um, from risky behavior. It's a preventative approach and it's typically carried out by health health roles helping at like at-risk drinkers, drug users uh, to make informed choice about the alcohol or drug use. So it's about educating them in, in what could, could happen from use. So people who will benefit are hazardous drinkers, dependent drinkers, recreational drug users and dependent drug users. So kind of whole host of people who, who can be affected by the brief interventions. So there might be somebody who's a hazardous drinker, but they're not aware of the implications that's having on their health. Um, so that might mean somebody who's a low level drinker who go, goes out every weekend and binge drinks. They're not aware that the lasting damage that can have on the liver, the kidney, the, the skin, the pancreas. So having those brief interventions, those conversations will help mitigate kind of future problems. So brief interventions also help third parties. So those with the health condition. So somebody who has, let's say, um, a fatty liver from from other kind of areas of their life, not necessarily from alcohol, having that conversation to say drinking can can further exacerbate these health problems will we'll mitigate the problems going forward. And people with different cultural backgrounds and access to information. Again, if you, for example, if you're a 75 year old person who doesn't really use the internet, doesn't really have access to, to social media, you're not going to be aware of all the, the implications that being a hazardous drinker may have on you. So it's all about kind of educating people into harm reduction techniques. So some of the harm reduction that we could cover. So again, avoid mixing alcohol or any other substances. Be aware of administration. So doses, not just in alcohol in terms of, this could be in terms of heroin or other opiates or non-opiates. Um, if injecting, always explore alternatives. Injecting is the most harmful route of administration of any kind of drug. Um, with alcohol, you have to encourage lower percentages and drink three days in between. So it's often kind of um, said to have, if you are been drinking, to have a few, few days off and then have a less less strength percentage the next time you do drink. And that will kind of help you ease your way off being dependent. Um, if someone's using heroin, it's also encouraged to never use on your own. Always have people around you, someone who can support you. Again, in terms of administrating naloxone, uh, if you're on your own and you are you are overdosing, you're not going to be able to administer naloxone, which is why it's recommended that someone else is always there. If in any doubt, always call 911 for immediate medical support and they'll be able to kind of ad advise further. Um, again, to reiterate, for those people who may be dependent on on substances or alcohol, stopping quickly can be very, very dangerous. Reducing at a slower rate is is most likely to be to be safer and and is encouraged. People who are injecting drugs, um, they can access CGL's needle exchange programs. 
Um, again, while they'll be given not only clean equipment if they are injecting, they'll also get the kind of brief interventions, harm reduction support, and the naloxone kit. So it it helps save lives generally. Uh, we're not just kind of giving away free 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 needles to, for people to use. Again, these are people who are addicted. They're not just coming into the service just for the sake of coming in. They are looking to change. So this is a kind of list of what support uh, CGL can offer. So you get an assigned key worker with one-to-one face-to-face -to -face support. Um, you're able to access our peer support groups. We have structured group work. So we have brief interventions, like we mentioned. We have something called the foundation courses, which are run three times a week here on site. And again, they kind of uh, equip people to, to learn what their triggers are and how to avoid them. We offer medical assessments by a whole multidisciplinary team. Um, we help with detox and rehab applications. We can refer to other services that may be of support. So for, for example, Mind um, is, is a partner that we work with. Um, we offer peer mentoring, ongoing recovery support, tailored treatment options. So no individual is treated the same way. Everybody's kind of pathway will be different. And we also offer support to family. So if somebody's dealing with substance misuse, we don't just kind of help them. We'll look at supporting their family. So we have a family group as well that our some of the workers here at CGL host. Um, brief interventions help more so with non-opioid uh, dependent clients, so people who are taking non-opioid drugs such as cocaine, cannabis, um, people who are drinking alcohol. Um, so the EIS, EIS team will kind of oversee them for 12 weeks and they kind of encourage them to, to make those smart decisions and have that aha moment to say, oh, this is what is leading to my drinking. So it avoids the kind of triggers without the, the medical support side of things. We also offer a foundation program, which is structured social psychological interventions based around the CBT method which explores, again, behaviours, triggers and patterns and how to mitigate those the best way. And again, the, the best way to refer is to, to fill out the referral form online, give us a call or even kind of just pop in um, to, to speak to somebody if, if you do need help. But again, if you are working with somebody who is dependent on any substances, you always have to seek their permission before referring them. Um, because they essentially they need to be wanting to change. They need to be engaging with the service. You can't just have a conversation with someone and think, OK, they need support. I'll sign them up. If that person is not willing to change, um, then we can't really support them. So there has to be a mutual understanding of, of growth in terms of that. So that was a, a quick breeze through of the session. Um, I do apologize that I've gone quite over. Um, this is the first time this training has been delivered, so it was quite hefty in terms of content. Um, but we do offer smaller training section, uh, sessions that are broken into sections. So opioid dependency is, is a 45 minute kind of course, and then the alcohol is 30 and then non-opiate as well. Um, so there's a variety of different kind of training that we do offer going forward. Um, we also are looking at developing other training sessions. So, for example, substance misuse and mental health, substance misuse and pregnancy and how that can affect children going forward. And then we are also open to kind of suggestions in terms of what capacity might be like for, for other people and services and what they might need. Um, so feel free to kind of send me an email, um, ask me any questions. Um, I think Laura's popped in the QR code for feedback. So on the feedback form, it offers a, a section that might um, be be applicable to some people. So if you want specialised training in, in something, we can look at develop, developing that and delivering that. Um, so, yeah, thank you for your time. And again, apologies that I have gone over. Um, but I hope you all find that informative and I hope you've learned something from today.